Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. So if you'd now like to take hold of your sheets, and we will look at uh, Psalm 66, verses 7 to 18. I will say the verses alternately. Bless our God, O you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who holds our souls in life and suffers not our feet to split. For you, O God, have proved us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the snare. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water but you brought us out into a place of liberty. I will offer you fat burnt sacrifices with the smoke of rams. I will sacrifice oxen and goats. I called out to him with my mouth, and his praise was on my tongue. If I had no evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me. He has heeded the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld his loving mercy from me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the cities and looked carefully at objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscriptions to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown that I proclaim to you, the God who has made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines but made, made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gave to a mortal's life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhibit the whole earth, and he allotted the time of their experience extant existence and the boundaries of the place where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him through indeed he is not far from each one of us for in him we live and move he have our being as even some of your own poets have said for we too are his offspring since we are God's offspring we ought not to think that the Deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the arts and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the time of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of his, this he has given assurance to all by rising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 14. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. 
I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. May I speak to the glory of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Saying goodbye can be painful. Over the years, members of my family have lived, and some still do live, many miles away. It's lovely to visit them, but it's always sad when we have to part and return home, not quite sure when we will see each other again. Today's Gospel reading is part of a long farewell discourse given by Jesus to his disciples on the night before he was crucified. He's trying to break it to his disciples that he is going to die, trying to prepare them for the terrible loss they're about to experience, and also to teach them what discipleship looks like. And of course the disciples are sad, they're confused, they're bewildered, their beloved master, Jesus, going to die? This certainly isn't part of the plan. Just moments before this, Jesus has stooped down and in an act of humble love and service, he has washed the disciples' feet, gently, lovingly. In trying to prepare them for the loss, he carries out one more loving act. And then he gives them a new commandment. Love one another, just as I have loved you. He doesn't say, go out and scatter a bit of love around occasionally, or love only those who love you. It is a command, and one to be taken seriously. Now John recounts this farewell discourse over four chapters uh, of his gospel, um, late on his, in his gospel. And for John, love is the basis of everything. God loves Jesus. Jesus loves God. God loves us. Jesus loves us. We love God through Jesus. And we're supposed to love each other. We're all bound together by the bond of love. Love, it's a difficult word. It can mean different things in different situations. Now, the New Testament was originally, as you probably know, written in Greek, which is a more subtle language than English. There are four words in Greek that are translated by the one word love in English. And so this could make for misunderstandings. There is one word for family love. I think it's pronounced storge. I'm not a Greek scholar. And this is parent for child, child for parent. Philia is a Greek word that means love between close friends. A tender, caring love but different from the love of a parent. Eros is a word 
for romantic love, the kind of love you feel when you fall in love, the kind of love you feel when you are in love. But the word that was used with regard to loving God and our neighbours is a word with which you may be familiar, agape. Agape is a distinctive New Testament word for love. It isn't sentimental or emotional. It isn't something that we fall into. Its, expressive, its expression is always moral <clears throat> and is revealed in obedience. So when Jesus gives us the command to love each other as he loves us, this is the kind of love he's talking about. So we are now in a better position to understand what it means to love each other. In other words, to love our neighbours. We're not being asked to love them as our nearest and dearest. That cannot be done. But we are being asked, indeed we are being commanded, to regard every person with benevolence and goodwill. We should always be concerned for the other's welfare. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can like every person with whom we come into contact. We all have our likes and our dislikes. Some people we get on with and others we just don't. But we can show them respect and goodwill and be concerned for their welfare. In other words, we can show them agape. Agape is a product of the will. It is something we have to work at and probably never wholly perfect. It is distinctive. It is the love which God has for us. But we shall not be able to love our neighbours if we um, unless we, um, sorry, lost my place. <laughs> we won't be able to love our neighbours ourselves, knowing nothing of God's love for us, supremely revealed in Jesus Christ, for agape is a reflection of that love. So, what does Jesus tell us that the most important commandment is that he's leaving us with? Simply this, love one another as I have loved you. And what does love require? It requires bending down and washing one another's feet, gently serving in the lowliest of ways. None of us will enter the kingdom of heaven by the high score of good deeds we may have totted up, nor by the number of bad deeds we may have avoided. God's method of assessing us has an entirely different basis. It all depends on love. Love of God, love of neighbour, a disposition of heart and soul that can be inspired and is inspired by our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But Jesus doesn't leave us to struggle with the Christian faith alone. He sends us an advocate to be with us forever. The word advocate is rather cold sounding, isn't it? The word Jesus used for the Holy Spirit is parakletos, which we translate as paraclete. Literally, it means someone called alongside you. We think of the Holy Spirit as someone who will walk alongside us, guiding us and helping us on our Christian journey. In some versions of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is known as the Comforter. The original meaning of a Comforter was to make someone brave. And he certainly did that for those first disciples those frightened men hiding away behind closed doors, frightened of the Jewish authorities. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were transformed 
There was no holding them back from preaching and teaching and spreading the good news of Jesus. If that hadn't happened then, there would have been no Christian faith, no Christian church, and we certainly wouldn't be gathered here this morning to worship God. Now, some of you, or all of you, may have heard of the Bayo Tapestry. This was a piece of work embroidered sometime after the Battle of Hastings in 1066. One of the scenes depicts King Harold poking his soldiers from behind with a long spear. And the caption underneath reads, King Harold comforting his soldiers, which seems rather amusing, doesn't it? He was encouraging them to be brave and urging them on into battle. Nowadays, we think of a comforter as someone who sympathises with us when we're sad. Well, no doubt the Holy Spirit does that, but to limit his work to that function alone is sadly to belittle him. We often talk of being able to cope with things, and that is precisely the work of the Holy Spirit. He takes away our inadequacies and enables us to cope with life and with our faith. The Spirit tells us that just as we have been comforted by the Spirit's presence, both in our hearts and in the gathered community of God's people, we are called to become the paracletes. We are to become the advocates. We are to become the comforters of those who find themselves orphaned, those who find themselves without protectors, those who find themselves without a voice. And so during this Christian Aid Week, we have an opportunity to love and serve our brothers and sisters around the world in humble, loving, joyful service. Because it is in serving the orphaned, the distressed, all those who are in need in our world, that we will come to fully know the presence of the risen Christ among us. And so to conclude, even the longest life spent loving God and one another is not long enough to know completely the wideness, the heights, or the depths of God's love for us. But thanks be to God, we have the story of God's love for us in Scripture. We have Jesus revealing himself to us so that we can see by example how to truly dwell in God so that we can welcome God in to dwell with us. And we have the Holy Spirit who fills us with hope, who gives us the power to act and to move more fully and deeply toward loving God and one another as God has loved us. So may we gladly keep God's commandments and the commandments of Jesus who says to us, his disciples, you who have my commandments and keep them are the ones who love me. And you who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love you and reveal myself to you. Love one another as I have loved you, and there I will be in the midst of you. Amen.